it's a people world out there, and you have got to surround yourself with good people. Mm-hmm. And I, I told somebody literally just the other day, I, I found out early on I wasn't the smartest guy in the room, but I found out that by surrounding myself with good people, it made me look a lot better. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, you've been in business, and, you know, you, you've got to have good people around you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that's going to make the company look better, and you look better. So yeah. Your brother told me once, I asked him what he did in his company. He said, I clean the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if the bathrooms are clean, my employees are happy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm here with uh, an old friend of mine, Jerry Moyes, who was the founder of Swift Transportation. Uh, I'm with the American Optimist, and we're here to talk about hope. Jerry, welcome. Thanks for coming on the show today. Well, thank you, Paul. So, Jerry, uh, before we start, tell us a little bit about Swift. I said the other day that Swift was the largest trucking company in the country, and you corrected me on that. So tell me a little about Swift. Well... I corrected you. I think it's the largest trucking company in the world. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, when um, you know when I got out of it, and you know since then it's merged with Knight, so it's right. obviously bigger than that. So uh, today I think it's the largest trucking company in the world. So how, how many trucks would that mean? How much? How much volume are you? I, shipping? I think how today. Do they measure that? I think today they run about twenty-two thousand trucks. Uh, oh my gosh! Grossing, uh, you know, probably. Uh, Six billion in that range. I'm I'm not sure of the number, but pretty close to that. So. Six billion dollars a year. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm hoping to do today, at least as kind of my starting point, I want to talk about how you went from uh, z- a zero to a hero. Right? It's <laughs> it's pretty amazing the story. But if you don't mind, tell me where where did you grow up? What were you thinking about doing this when you were a young kid? Tell me about uh, your early life. Well, I was. Uh, Born and raised in a little town called Plain City, Utah, a little town outside of Ogden, uh, 750 people, kind of a little farming, lazy community. And the interesting thing about this little community, five of the major trucking companies in the United States and probably the world, come four come out of this little town of 750 people. That's amazing. So it's, that's quite a whole separate story. But uh-huh. uh, How did that happen? There was a guy by the name of C.R. England, Chess, old man Chess, and he started uh, C.R. England, and and his son Gene, who is now 101 or two, and my dad used to drive with him, and so my dad kind of spun off of England's, and and uh, then we come down here, and the Knights come with us, and so the Knights kind of spun off of us, and and then the fourth company was a company called Pride. Pride of England, and uh, he was one of the England sons, and he spun off of that. So there's four of the major trucking companies in the United States all come out of Plain okay. City, Utah. So all right, so you grow up in this little town of 750 people. What was that like? Well, it was it was very interesting, and everybody knew everybody, and uh, but it was everybody worked. I mean, we had a work ethic. I mean, it was whether it was picking tomatoes or asparagus or hoeing beets or whatever it was, or hauling hay. Everybody had a job. And I worked, I jokingly tell the story, I worked at a gas station for 10 years at a dollar an hour and never got ahead of my gas bill. But, <laughs> and gas was 22 cents a gallon back then. Yeah. But, uh, but we had a work ethic, and we really developed that. And, and you, whether you talk about the Knights or the Englands, uh, and there's a lot of other successful companies that have come out of this little town, but you know, we started off. We had we had no option. I mean, it was you work, and that's the way it is. And and the interesting thing is, uh, everybody had a, a really fancy fast car, and that was part of the deal. You make make a dollar an hour, and you could buy a fancy car for that. So yeah, it's a loud motor, huh? <laughs> a lot of motor. So yeah. and so, I know you. Ha- I know one of your brothers, Ronnie. But uh, you, did you have other brothers or sisters? No, um, I had one brother, one sister. Dad, uh, dad never, he did a little bit of farming, but he was kind of, he would buy the potatoes and the onions from the farmers and, and process them and sack them and take them down to market. And that's kind of how he got in the trucking side of it. And, and, uh, that's, so you know, what, what was your motivation to get into trucking? 
Well, that's a good question. Um, I was, um, I had worked my whole life and driven trucks since I was 14, 15 years old and mechanic, I, you know, I could do anything. And, and one day I'd literally just graduated from college. I'd went to Weber State and, and, um, what was your major, if you don't mind my asking? Well, I'd, I was working two jobs, and my business, my major was business with a minor in accounting, and I got a B average. Now that's not very, <laughs> very good, but uh, considering I never studied and worked full time, I, I, I felt pretty good about getting a B average at Weaver State. I so, always like uh, to say I graduated in the top ninety-five percent of my class. Well, which means only five percent graduated worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. But anyway, we was uh, sitting around one day, and I'd literally just graduated from college, and uh, and my dad was hauling. He had four or five trucks there in, in Ogden, and and uh, a gentleman out of Los Angeles who he was hauling for uh, come in one day, and I was literally in my coveralls. I'd been out, you know, mechanic and on trucks, and he walked in and says, "Carl, my dad, um, you need to move to Phoenix." Um, you're doing 20% of my business up here in Utah and Idaho and Montana, and 80% of my business is in Arizona, and I'm mad at my trucker, and I'm going to change, and if you'll go to Phoenix, I'll give you my business. How many trucks did he have? Four. Four, okay. And uh, my dad says, I'm not moving to Phoenix. It's too hot down there. And uh, he's here's Jerry. Why don't you guys go down there? And this guy, very successful businessman, looked me in the eye and says, how much money you got, boy? And I said, I've got five thousand dollars. Now I'm 22 years old, and yeah. you know, work for a dollar an hour. And, uh -huh. and he says, Okay, I'll put in five thousand. We'll go down there. We'll be 50-50 partners, and take one of your old dad's trucks, and let's go to Phoenix. So that's kind of where it all got started. So, so you started with one truck. One truck. Yeah. All right. So how did you grow it from there? By the way, your brother went with you. Well, that that was years later. Oh, so okay. um, so I come down with one truck, and that was in 1966, and. Uh, that was kind of a famous year for me. I graduated from college, got married, moved to Phoenix all in one and year. Became and became a trucker. Become a trucker. And, uh -huh. of course, I've been a trucker my whole life. I, um, Ke Kevin Knight jokingly tells the story that Jerry says that was all uh, there was diesel fuel in the water and was all conceived in sleepers of the truck. So uh, <laughs> that's how come we all become truckers. So yeah. I'm not sure that's a true story, but it sounds good anyway. So, but, uh, so I come down to Phoenix and... You know, started uh, and I was driving to LA and back, and you were know, you, it, were you actually driving the truck? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, I I knew. I, so I you got one truck and you're doing all the driving. Well, I'd drive all night and come home and do all the the work during the daytime and drive all night and I mean it, it's ridiculous to look back at how hard we worked. I mean, we was working twenty four seven and and we didn't think anything about it, it was. I guess too stupid to think about sleeping, yeah. but uh, but you know, and one truck grew to two, and so so. Do you remember the day you made the decision to go to two trucks? Well, that was in 1967, and uh, actually, my dad come down and drove the second truck, so he moved down from from Salt Lake, and uh, wow. and uh, then about that time, a little later than that, my brother moved to Los Angeles with Randy Knight and went to work for the steel company that uh, the guy that kind of got us in business down mm -hmm. here and uh, so they they actually worked over in Los Angeles for a while with him so doing trucking also well the the, the buying of the sell and the steel and oh, okay more right. the uh, the business side of that side of the business and All right. so we uh, we was running two and three and four and got up to you know five six trucks and at that time do you only have know. one customer or did you well, we started multiple? we started getting into other businesses, and uh -huh. obviously, uh, his business was import steel out of Japan back in them days. It was all Japanese steel, and and so it all come into the port of Long Beach, and and so as we was moving into other cities, Salt Lake and Denver and Albuquerque and Phoenix, we was getting backhauls back in, and and um, uh, back in them days, it, the Transportation was very regulated the Interstate Commerce Commission, and you couldn't just go out and buy a truck. You had to, uh, you had to own the product you was hauling, as, which is how we we did it. Uh, but uh, you had to apply for these ICC authorities, and they were very very difficult to get. And uh, I spent probably 20 years, 
probably half my time just getting the authorities. So it wasn't like you go to a customer and, and work on getting the business. You had to have the authority first and then go get the business. So it was it was some pretty tough times back then. But. So you go from, when do you start to know you're gonna really create a larger business? At what point? Did it just keep happening organically or did you actually get to the point where you made a conscious decision? You wanted to, to scale it faster. Well, we started in 1966 and in 1990, so that's, what's that, 24 years, we was at about 250 million in revenues and we decided to go public. I mean, we were growing a very capital intensive business with no money and it was very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, give a truck driver his paycheck on a Friday and say, hold it till Monday, it's not any good. Did you actually and, have to do that? Oh, many a times. And yeah. Tell a steel vendor that, or a uh, fuel vendor that you know, I know I owe you for a couple of months, but I need a couple more truckloads of fuel. And I mean, it was it was a very difficult time. Uh, Even at two hundred and forty million dollars worth of revenue, though, would you say? Well, our, the joke was we'd make a thousand dollars, would go spend ten on a new truck. So, yeah. uh, but uh, but in nineteen ninety, we went public, and um, uh, we got twenty two million dollars out of Wall Street. And I tell a story I've never taken any coke in my life but I can t tell you it was on one heck of a high after that <laughs> 22 million so yeah <laughs> but it really allowed us and we told Wall Street that we felt that we could grow uh, 20 percent a year 10 percent internal and 10 percent through acquisitions and um, so we uh, we told Wall Street that we thought we could do one acquisition a year and and I think we did 10 in 12 years and uh, plus growing internally. So we, we grew at about 25% a year. And Okay, so uh, wait a minute. Now you're, you start with one truck, you've grown in this period of time to having 240 million in revenue, but you're still stressed on debt and everything else. Wh what gives you the idea to go public? I mean, that, that had to be at least a little bit of a leap in your mind. Well, it was something that other trucking companies in our industry were ha had were either looking at or had done. Clarence Warner, Warner had done it a couple of years before, and there was another couple of companies that had done it. So they had kind of laid the, the the roadmap out there for me to do. Well, one man can do, so can another. Just well, it, what they it, do. Like, and Clarence and I are good friends, and so you know we followed each other, and uh, if, if he can do it, so can we do it. So, mm -hmm. so it was... Um, you know, it was a, an answer we had to. We were so far in debt and and uh, in a in a very capital intensive industry. You know, we we had to have some help. Yeah. And so uh, that was the decision we made, and it was a very very good decision. Were so. there downsides to going public? Things that were, uh, were made it hard. Well, there was a few problems, like the board of directors. I had a answer to a board of directors, and there was a couple times I didn't get completely along with the board of directors, and. That created a few other problems, and uh, but being public, there was it. There was a lot of positives to it. It created um, better accountability to you. I mean, you had to have your numbers very accurate on a quarterly basis, and these Wall Street guys would call you, and you know they'd spend all day figuring out what the questions were, and and uh, you know why was this number up and this number down, and. And so it, it made a better company out of us to uh, become public. And, you know, it, it uh, certainly benefited us by... Raised the bar. Ra raised the bar and helped us raise the bar, so... Yeah. Do you... Uh, what? So were there challenges in reporting, not only the quarterly reporting, but whatever report you had to hand over to SEC and others? Oh, it was always challenging, Paul, but it was never nothing... Um, you know, we always had a good accounting department, a good accounting staff, and... And our numbers were always good, so we never had to uh, uh, play any games with our numbers. Uh, you know, they was always pretty outstanding, and so uh, the guy we, told we me stood he by to meet so. you once, and I, he gave me the greatest description ever. He said, all these suits walked up, and this guy with jeans and cowboy boots. And he says, and damn it, that wasn't the guy that owned the company. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that a lot? Well, s sometimes, yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it was it a was, uh, great, great experience going public. And yeah. You know, we got to know some great people on Wall Street and and uh, people that, you know, give us a lot of advice and a lot of help. So, yeah. Okay, so I remember 
skiing with you once uh, when you had uh, left the company. Another group of people had taken it over. Uh, they were in charge of it. I don't remember how old you were, but you and I were on a ski slope. You were at least <laughs> in your <laughs> early 70s, I think. Um, and, uh, and you said to me uh, something along the line. You said, well, I'm going to go back and buy this company back. And, uh, and I said, Jerry, you, this is like the first time you've had any freedom since I've <laughs> known you. And, and now you want to go back and put yourself right back in the hot seat. And you turned and looked at me almost with a scowl. And you said, it's my company, Johnson. <laughs> so is that how it felt? Well, as I said earlier, I got crossways with the board a couple of times. And, um, and one time I actually took the company back private. Uh-huh. And um, What does that mean? Taking a company private. Well, I actually bought all the shares back. I had to borrow a ton of money, huh. and I don't remember what the number was, but the joke was uh, somebody had come up to me and say, well, Jerry, how much is your interest expense today? And I said, well, that's good news and bad news. The good news, or the bad news, it's a million dollars a day, but the good news is only five days a week. So <laughs> <laughs> They gave you weekends off. Yeah, they gave me weekends off. But um, So, you know, we had some challenges, and we took it private and then we took it back public again and uh, but when you took it private so and maybe i didn't understand completely but it seems like it certainly you didn't you didn't go back in and take the company over because you needed the money oh no that had nothing to do with it it was you know more ego and and you know i it was it was my company i built this baby up and you know that's the way it was and so it really had nothing to do with money it uh, was more ego so and do you find, um, did you find that you, because you built it up, that you ran it better than other people, in your, in your belief or your opinion? Well, uh, that's a good question, Paul. And, and you know, whenever you get in business, that um, it's a people world out there, and you have got to surround yourself with good people. Mm-hmm. And I, I told somebody literally just the other day, I, so I found out early on I wasn't the smartest guy in the room, but I found out that by surrounding myself with good people, it made me look a lot better. Yeah. And, um, and you know, you've been in business, and, you know, you, you've got to have good people around you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that's going to make the company look better, and you look better. So. Yeah. Your brother told me once, I asked him what he did in his company. He said, I clean the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if the bathrooms are clean, my employees are happy. <laughs> but there's truth to that. The, y- you do the things that they don't want to do. And sometimes that their ego or their degree or their pedigree won't let them do. Well, and that's one thing early on in our days is um, I always had the attitude that I'm not going to ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Hmm. And if it was to go out and change a tire or change the oil on a truck or uh, take a truck to Flagstaff in a snowstorm or whatever, I would do that. Hmm. And every every driver or every employee knew that uh, – if they didn't want to do it, I, I knew how to do it, and I would do it. So that was kind of important early on. So I, I want to think about this vision thing, because I know that a lot of entrepreneurs try to figure out uh, when people get to your stage, did they, did they plan it? Were they just optimistic? Did they luck into it? Um, and I know you've kind of given us the story, but would you tell me that you always had a plan to scale this company from the beginning? Did, were you always ambitious, always wanting to grow it? Or did it just start to happen because you saw the possibility in front of you? Well, that's a good question, Paul. We we just kept growing because we had to. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, we had customers that were in demand. We had, you know, in, in those times, we had good employees. We had plenty of drivers. And we were just growing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the demand was out there, the opportunity was there, and we were growing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once we got public after 1990, you know, uh, being public was good news and bad news. The bad news was there was pressure from you to produce good numbers and grow the top line. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys were very top line oriented as, as well as bottom line. So it uh, it became a top line world. So. What was the single biggest key to why your customers picked you to – ship their product instead of the other competitors? What, what was it that gave you a competitive advantage? <clears throat> well, I think what gave us a competitive advantage, Paul, is I was always very involved with the sales. And these big customers wanted to deal with somebody that could make a decision. And they all had my cell phone. If we had a problem, blame me at 2 or 3 in the morning, um, 
I got a phone call. In fact, I'll never forget midnight one night, I'm over at the sand dunes, I get a call from Sears, and there's, this is when Sears was in her heyday, and they had a problem, they needed, there was a big snowstorm in Boston, and they need snow blowers from Chicago to Boston, and they needed a team right then. Well, guess who they called? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was th those relationships that we had, and, and um, you know, we was able to grow with our top customers. I mean, we didn't have to add customers we could grow with our existing customers and mm -hmm. you know we was a very small percentage of the existing business so how about showing up on time how important did that end up being well that, obviously that's very important to these okay. customers and and did you track that oh yes definitely that was a measurable number oh yes yeah and and we were always pretty good on time so mm -hmm. that was not a obviously that was a uh, uh, something we ma measured very closely and our customers our, believe me our customers measured it probably more than we did. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was not one of our, our major issues. I mean, w we did a pretty good job on, on service, so. Mm -hmm. How about safety? Safety was um, obviously number one. Um, at, at the end, we was, um, to, to prove, you know, how safe we were, we was $10 million deductible in our liability. We had no collision, no cargo, and, um, you know, we, we had to perform safe mm -hmm. because it was it was our money and we had you know 40 terminals around the country that was measured on 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 their uh, their their uh, profitability and one of the big items was their safety mm -hmm. and everybody uh, recognized that safety was number one technology tell me about the role technology did play and what it does play in trucking today well when i was involved technology was um just starting and you know we had um, uh, tracking systems on our trucks and on our trailers, and we thought that was so great. Because you just knew where they were. Oh, we knew where they were, and yeah. we knew, you know, a, dry, a shipper would call and say, "Where's my truck?" And we could say, "Well, he's two hours out, and he'll be there." You know, we we know exactly where he is, and um, so it was just starting to get into technology, and then from the accounting side, you know, we were starting to get uh, um, a lot of um, a lot of IT information faster. Um, and, and one thing as, as we get into entrepreneurial, it's, it's very important. Y you've got to have your numbers and you got to have them fast. And you don't have to have a lot of them. I mean, I used to always look at five, six numbers. I mean, you can get spreadsheets and, you know, you can drive yourself nuts on, Data. on, 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 on numbers, but uh -huh. I would walk in every morning and I, I had four, five, six numbers that I would look at and I knew how we did. And uh, I went to our, our CPA or our CFO and, and uh, we actually had a daily financial statement. Wow. Now it wasn't hundred percent accurate, uh -huh. but it was pretty darn accurate, but it was, you know, a few basic items and, and, uh, but as, as you, whatever business you get into, You've got to be able to measure where you stand on a on a daily basis, and you've got to be able to react, and and not so much from or also from a corporate level, but your your smaller divisions or your smaller uh, departments that you have. So, mm -hmm. what were the five numbers you looked at? Do you recall any of them? Well, it was revenue per mile, revenue, uh, labor as an expense of revenue, fuel 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 economy. I mean, you know, kind of. It was basic stuff, so. Was it hard to get your accounting team to get you that data on a daily basis? Did you have to push them, or did they? Uh well, they, they had IT, or you know, this was in the days of huh? starting to develop the IT, and, and we actually had systems off our trucks that would show us the fuel economy on a truck on a per day basis. Wow. And it's idle time, and you know, stuff like this, we started really being able to measure and manage, and. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, where's you know, I, IT was really very important, and, and of course it continues. So. Where's I, uh, where is technology today? What's going on in trucking with technology today? Well, it's, uh, it, it just continues to grow. And uh, of course you hear a lot about the, you know, the, it, are we going to have a driverless truck? And you and I have talked. I, I don't think we're going to have a driverless truck. I have my opinion that uh, I think that, uh, larger companies, the Swifts and the big companies, 
should do what's what they're doing over in Europe on the Audubons, is, and that's uh, patooning, they call it. And you'll patooning? put three trucks together, mm-hmm. and they, they're they hooked together electronically, and you have one driver driving the first one, and you may, be, may have a driver in the second one, the third one, maybe you don't. In, in Europe, they're not having uh, a mm-hmm. driver in the second, third one. But I, I think from a... Uh, this all has to be approved on a state le- state by state level, and I just don't think it's going to get approved, Paul. I uh, mm-hmm. uh, I just think there's t- too much risk out there, and and um, so what will they have? Well, will they have the ability to do platooning if they have three drivers in the yeah, car? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and I think that's the answer. Uh-huh. And you know you're going to save a little bit on fuel economy, and there, there's other savings that. Uh, you know that you can have and that second third driver don't have to log on duty Mm -hmm. i mean he can be you know doing his paperwork or or actually you know sleeping actually yeah so um my guess is you get a safer record too from what may happen in technology would you agree oh yes definitely yeah. yeah yeah so you know there's a tremendous opportunity in technology and uh whether it's the trucking industry or or whatever industry it is that, uh, uh, you know, we're just so great to have this opportunity that we have, uh, you know, from an, an IT standpoint. And I'm not an IT expert, and, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, there's... But you spent a lot of time in technology. Well, I spent a lot of, drive, a lot of time driving truck, too, so... Yeah. <laughs> so, so to begin with, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't buy into the fear if you were a trucker that they're going to be displaced by technology. They're just probably going to be enhanced by technology Th- that is correct yes i just don't see uh the the driverless truck uh, uh there there's just too many oddball situations out there that i, I just don't think that's going to happen is mm-hmm. m- my opinion now maybe i'm wrong so yeah all right so um if you were thinking about an entrepreneur today the fact that you started again almost with zero and became a hero would you uh would you say that's impossible for a young person or a person to do today or would you, do you think it's still possible in this country? No, I, I think it's very possible today, Paul. I, I think, you know, first of all, we live in the greatest country there is. And mm-hmm. you and I have been around the world and been in a lot of countries. And every time I come back to this country, I kiss the ground. I, I don't literally, but mm-hmm. appreciate more what we have here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have a great country. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'll insert... Uh, Paul sent me a uh, optimistic American, the optimistic American yeah. from the doctor from uh, Bosnia, yeah. and a cute story. So years ago, my wife, I come home one day, and my wife had been to a church, and our church was had some Bosnians over here. They were uh, refugees that they were supporting, and and they needed jobs, and they were mechanics. I said, well, sure, we'll hire them. So we hired ten Bosnian mechanics, and they were great employees. I mean, good, solid employees. So a few years later, she come home with in. Our, our church is, has some um, so, so Serbian, I guess okay. it was Serbians. And I said, sure, we'll bring them on. Well, we had our shop look like a bloody war down there. <laughs> you, you, can't meet, you can't mix Bosnians <laughs> and <laughs> Serbs together. No, no. And, you know, in the United States, we're so fortunate – no matter what your religion is or what part of the country you're from or what ethnic background, we all get together. We don't, we don't think that way. But uh, it really brought out, uh, you know, watching that iPod, iPad yeah. or iPod that, uh, you know, how it added to how fortunate we are. And, you know, with the problems we've got in Ukraine over oh there my. today and, you know, how horrible that is. But, you know, they, they've, they've been that way, for, you know, forever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we haven't went through that. Of course, we went through the Civil War, but, you know, in, in the West, we didn't see that. But, uh, yeah, we have 250 years of rule of law, and, that, and, <clears throat> and we've built up institutions, and those institutions in many ways are our safety blanket. Yeah. You yeah. Know, they, they make certain that that freedom kind of stays in place, and if one branch kind of goes haywire, the other branches can kind of move them back into the center. And, okay. and I, I also believe, I think one of the most important things is – don't overemphasize politics. 
they're they're always going to be fighting in politics. It's what they do. That's <laughs> what they get paid to do. We're it, doing a pretty good job of it now, but yep. that's another story. But, but, but you know, I like, like emphasizing business and entrepreneurship because that's where there's real promise. Yeah. But you know, Paul, back to your question on entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, there there are so tremendous opportunities out there right now today. Now, I as I said earlier, I'm not an IT guy. But there's huge opportunities in, in IT mm -hmm. that I won't get into because I don't understand it all. But in other businesses, I mean, uh, I'm 78 years old, and I see three or four things every day. God, if I was only 50, I would go into that business. Uh -huh. And uh, But, you know, it's there, there's great opportunity out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as um, – it, it, one of the things I think is you need to do as an entrepreneur, and, and first of all, you got to have an education. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said earlier, I have a minor in accounting, and I don't care what business you're in, you've got to have a minor in accounting. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand the numbers. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're in healthcare, whatever business you're in, you've got to understand accounting. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how anybody can go through college and get a doctorate degree from wherever and not understand simple accounting principles mm -hmm. because you've got to do that. You so have to be able to read a balance sheet, you, you got, P&L. And, and when you go to a bank, you've got to understand what they're looking for, what, you know, mm -hmm. what, what they look like. You know, what's the difference in EBITDA on net profit and mm -hmm. CapEx and a few of those terms. And they're not so rocket science. It just takes it, a little bit of time to understand you, you, them. You just got to understand it. Mm -hmm. So, but also I would really recommend as, as, as you're, you know, going through school is, is look around at different, different opportunities, different, um, different careers. Uh, and as you're doing that, look for opportunities of how, how do I improve that? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm working for McDonald's, how do I better, how can I do a better job than McDonald's? Now that's probably impossible, but mm -hmm. uh, no matter what the business is, there's always opportunities for some type of improvement. And as, as you're going through your education, um, look at opportunities like that, mm -hmm. and and don't don't be afraid to have three or four jobs going through college. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you learn from those jobs. You learn from those jobs, and not just you, the money. Yeah, uh, and don't get hung up on the money. Get hung up on what am I going to learn? Is this a different business? Is this something I might be interested in? Uh, is this something my family might be doing? Is is different from what I'm doing? It's mm -hmm. not what my background is. But, you know, it's, uh, but okay. anyway, in, in conclusion, there's just great opportunities out there I, today. I, so. Yeah, I'm not going to let you conclude it that easy. You have 10 children, right? Yep. And I believe they're all adopted? All adopted, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, um, obviously, we couldn't have children. We started adopting children and adopting and adopting and adopting. Once you um, get in that um, environment. Uh, there's a lot of children out there, and we've been very successful. We've had uh, uh, 10 great children, and mm -hmm. we've got them raised. Now we have 28 grandchildren and nine great, I think it is, something like that. Yeah. And so I think uh, you told me a story once of one of them literally being dropped off at the office. Tell that story. So we went to Lake Powell. When, uh, we, we go to Lake Powell every year for Memorial Day, and, uh, and one of my sons was staying home and dispatching, and and uh, there's a lot more to the story I won't get into. And he called me up at Lake Powell, and he says, Hey, Daddy, some six-year-old kid just came in on one of our trucks out of Florida, and he says he's my new brother. What am I supposed to do with him? <laughs> I said, Well, take him home and love him. We'll be home in three or four days. But he was, uh, we was in the process of adopting him, and uh, it happened a little faster than what we thought. But yeah. uh, <laughs> anyways. And, uh, and you, just, you just did. You just adopted him. Yep, yep, yeah. All right, so do you, with your children, are all of them entrepreneurs or some of them in just working in labor? or at, What what types yeah, of things do you see? Do you let them choose for themselves? That's kind of a, a, a bad subject, Paul. Uh -huh. I, I just can't get them motivated to, to take over some of these businesses I've got. You know, I've got, you know, I've had, I've sold a couple of them, but, you know, I've, I've had four or five pretty successful businesses, and, uh -huh. you know, they, they just don't want anything to do with them, and, you yeah. know, they have their other things they're doing. You're which never is, a profit in your which own Which is fine. I figured that out immediately. Huh? You're never a profit in your own home. Well, I, I found that out, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, all right, so um, would you, let me start with kind of 
normal jobs. Half of America makes about $35,000 a year today. But I think most people know if you want to work today, as long as you're not disabled, and sometimes even if you are disabled, there's an ability to work. But um, you had told me once about uh, uh, the different types of jobs and, uh, and opportunities that are available in trucking. You want to maybe talk a little bit about anything from mechanics to drivers? Well, in, in our industry, you know, there's, um, um, you know, you can start with the truck driver. You know, a lot of drivers make 100000 a year out there today. Mm-hmm. Um, our mechanics, um, I've been out of the business for two or three years, but, you know, I'm sure they're, you know, $30,000, $40,000 or $30, $40 an hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I told you I was just had lunch today with a, uh, um, a, a truck dealership, and he raised his salary from 60 to $70 an hour from his lead mechanic out there. And so, you know, those are good jobs. Yeah. And, and once you get and on the 140,000 a year. Yeah. And once you get on the office side, you know, there's uh, really good jobs and uh, Swift. Um, we, we had a policy of, of doing a lot of what we call stock options. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, even though we might not have been paying as high as everybody else, or but w- we gave a lot of stock options away. And in fact, a uh, cute story: I had a uh, one of our key employees retired the other day at 55, and I said, "Well, I said, well, how, how can you retire at 55 years old?" He says, "You gave me too many stock options, so <laughs> it was all my fault." So a lot of people don't understand what a stock option is. Explain that to them. Well, in 1990. There, the rules were a little different in 1990, but in 1990, I brought our top 22 people into the office, and I said, you know, we're going to go public, and I don't quite understand all this stuff, but I'm going to give you guys a lot of these stock options. And they later become what I called golden handcuffs. They didn't vest for five years, and they had to be there for 10 years to get 100% vested. So uh, it literally, and of course, our stock was growing at 25, 30 percent a year. So it, it become they, they, they couldn't quit, mm-hmm. and uh, it really became uh, a huge advantage for us. And of course, in the meantime, we were given them more options to where, you know, we had very, very key employees that e- everybody was trying to hire, but they couldn't quit because they'd lose all these stock options. So, mm-hmm. but it, it back to your question, it gives them an option to buy stock at a certain price at a certain date in advance. And of course, like I said, our stock was always growing at 25% a year, so. Uh, so they bought it at, uh, at five bucks or 10 bucks, uh, and it went up the next year to 12 bucks. They'd end up making the $2.50 yeah. difference so long as they were able to make it through some period of time. Right, right, It was right. necessary. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, to me, that's one of the things that I recommend to young people all the time. If you don't go into business for yourself, Go into business with somebody that'll give you stock options. Yep, go yep. into somebody that'll give you a piece of the business. And there's lots of opportunities out there that will do that. And you know, Paul and I have a good friend, Dave, and I won't say his last name, but yeah. y- you know, he's uh, definitely a beneficiary of some of those. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's been awesome, <laughs> definitely. So, um, so you've started other businesses. Um, one of the businesses that I know that uh, I, I know you've also been an investor in lots of things. You've invested in the, I think, the Phoenix Suns and the the Diamondbacks and the Cardinals and others. You also invested in the Coyotes. And uh, I always found the, that interesting as well because you brought them to Glendale. You were kind of a Glendale guy. You were loyal to Glendale. You know, I started off with the, uh, with the Diamondbacks. I was one of the first investors with the Diamondbacks. And uh-huh. Jerry came to me, and, and uh, I was one of the first. And I owned a little bit of part of the Suns, not a big part. And did you really do those to make money, or did you do those just to help the community? Help the community. Yeah. Help the community. But So one day I happened to be down at the Diamondbacks, and I saw what they were paying for their airplanes to, tr- to fly around. And, and uh, so I assumed that the sons were paying the same. And so I went to Jerry, and I said, Jerry, you know, if we— uh, Jerry Colangelo. Colangelo. Yeah. And I said, if, if I buy a 737, of course, I I'd had a couple of business jets at the time, and— I said, if I buy a 737, and we, you know we painted up diamond backs and sun's colors, will yeah. will will you use any? Well, sure, sure. So anyway, so that started us in what we call the big airplane business, and we ended up uh, with 26 737s. 
Uh, we, wow. We, we sold it here yeah. a couple of three years ago, but it was a, a very good business. But it started off, you know, because of um, investing in the Diamondbacks. Yeah. So uh, the, the jump into the Coyote deal, that, that was a very poor decision. I, I lost a ton of money on it. Um, you know, it goes back is is hockey designed for the for the desert. Yeah. And uh, you know, I've been out of it for a number of years, and you know, they're they're still losing a lot of money out there. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, now they're in a fight, and they move they're moving when out. When you of Glenn. did it originally, was it to make money, or was it again to try to help the valley? It, it was kind of help the valley. It yeah. was it was not a, a profit situation. So. Yeah. So it's a. Uh, I mean, to me, it's kind of amazing, and, uh, and and certainly that became a huge part of Westgate and it being opened up and other things. So, all right, so I know you've owned a steel company, I think a motorcycle company. You've had, uh, you're a serial entrepreneur <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. What makes you decide when you're going to invest in a business? Well, a lot of them are almost by accident or... Um, Starting off very very small, not thinking what you're going to get to, and y you know you brought up the steel company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I own um, my first cousin owns ten percent of it, and it's very successful because of him, not because of me, because mm -hmm. he's the one that's up there running up in Salt Lake. But uh, you know we we bought this thing 25 years ago on a freak situation. It was a company that we actually bought out of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's developed it into a terrific company. We, uh, you know, we we did about uh, probably a third of the st the hotels on Las Vegas Strip. Uh, we did the 49ers football stadium. We just recently done the Rams football stadium. We did not do the roof, but we did everything else but the roof. Um, and you know, it's it's turned out to be a very successful operation. Mm -hmm. But. Um, you know, it was at the right time, at the right place. With uh, how much time do you spend with that now? Um, I spend about um, probably uh, one day a quarter. Okay. I, I don't spend a lot of time up there. Mm -hmm. uh, but your cousin spends a lot of time. Yeah. On it. Oh, he's he's full time up there. Same yes. concept that uh, that all of his customers has his phone number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That seems uh, to be one of your secrets. Yeah, I have a couple sayings that I say, and, and um, one of them is to be successful, be at the right place at the right time with the asset. Now, that asset can be your brain, your muscle, your money, your mind, whatever you put in the word asset, to put something together. Mm -hmm. But it's being at the right place at the right time with the asset to put something together. Yeah. And the other and I, I just went over this with another company that I'm doing business with that I'm not involved in it, that is, the guy has made it so complicated. I have another saying it's called KISS. Keep it simple, Sally. Whatever business you get into, you can get so carried away and get so complicated, and you don't have to do that. Keep it simple. And uh, so that that will help you a little bit. So Yeah. So... These are the uh, Jerry Moy stories that I will always remember. <laughs> I remember uh, you took me up to Lake Powell back, I don't remember, I think it was like right after I left the mayor's office or something, and we went up through Antelope Canyon. Was that where it was, where we walked up through that stream? Oh, uh, no, it wasn't Antelope. It was, uh, anyway. Yeah, and we walked up through that stream, and I recall we had like 10 people, <laughs> and you were kind of at the lead, and uh, you were definitely the oldest guy amongst us, but still one of the strongest. We got to that waterfall, and uh, we had to lift different people up on the waterfall. You're pulling, and I'm pushing our buddy Mike up to the top, and you're yelling at him, hey, Ironside, you got to help us. Um, but what I remember the most is that when we came back from that hike, we got to the little place where the harbor was, and the boat had disappeared. And uh, after the boat disappeared, we're like, well, what are we going to do? Everybody's a little panicked. And also we turn around, and you've jumped in the water, and you're swimming out to the middle of the lake <laughs> to try to find that boat. And I'm like, okay, there's no way I could let him go by himself. This, this would be a shame mission if I did that. So I jumped in behind you, but you didn't know that I jumped in. And then you got in that little teeny tiny canyon. I remember that boat would hit each side of that wall when we were coming into it. And I heard that big old motor start up, and I thought, oh, my gosh, he doesn't know I'm here. He's going to hit my head right into the, the side of this wall. But, yeah. uh, but the thing that I always noticed with you was, 
just like you said, it never bothered you to get your hands dirty. You were always first in. Oh, yeah. I never never worried about me getting my hands dirty. So, yeah, that was a fun trip back in those days. We did quite a few of them and uh, yeah. had some fun times. So. so what do you spend your time doing now? Do you spend it with your kids, your grandkids? <coughs> what, what's the, uh, what are the big projects that are on your list now? Well, um, you know, I'm still... I still have two or three still pretty active business. I still own the marina. Mm -hmm. I still own the steel company. I'm starting to become a little more active up there. Uh -huh. And, you know, four or five different real estate projects. And uh, I just recently sold the FBO at the airport. And uh, I, I still own what's called the 135 certificate. We're in the process of selling that. What so is the 135 certificate? The, a charter the, okay. where you can charter airplanes. And uh -huh. Anyway, so... So I'm. I have plenty to do still. I create yeah. plenty to do. So, and uh, and you're all out of Swift now, correct? I'm 100% out of Swift. Yeah. 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 And uh, is that uh, does that relieve some stress? Yeah. It was. It was a tough job. It was uh, a lot of stress, a lot of work, and I'm glad to be out of it. And Are you glad you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the nights are in there running now they're they've kind of moved on a little bit, and they've got you know the next generation in there, but th they're doing very well and. You know, the stock's doing good, so. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing That's to good, so. All right, well, Jerry, thank you so much. We All appreciate right. you uh, you coming in. Um, you know, it, it's always interesting to me to just kind of think through the lessons uh, that come from this. I, I love the uh, a couple of the lessons that you gave us here today, at least that I'm going to walk away with. One of the big ones was there's still a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurs, that even if you have nothing, if you want to try to get started, there's options all around. You just have to look. Uh, the second one that I, I liked is that um, there are also jobs that are available for people, and some of them are high-paying jobs. But you said, I as part of your spiel, education, that's a key. Um, you know, it, it, I was listening to Ray Dalio the other day, and he made some really interesting points, but uh, some of them were a bit frightful in terms of how he viewed where the uh, country was going. But he said to fix those problems, there are just two things that we need to do. We need to make more than we uh, spend, and he said, we need to be kind to one another. We need to be nice. Especially, that especially the second one. So. Yep, especially the second one. Yeah. And, and like I said earlier, I, I don't think you need to have, you know, no, no fancy degrees. But, you know, you've got to get a basic education. Learn, learn how to deal with people. You know, a little bit of man some management skills. And, mm -hmm. and, and as we, we talked about, certainly accounting. You, you've got to have a, a, at least a minor or at least some accounting okay, classes. Okay, i got to go back and ask one more question. So... <clears throat> You talked about get along with people. How many people work for your company? Well, in our heyday, we probably had uh, 25,000. All right. How do you lead 25,000 people from a leadership standpoint? What are the main skills that are important in that? Well, first of all, you got to have good people underneath you. Mm -hmm. And um, we had, um, you know, we had 40 terminals around the country, and mm -hmm. but we were very standardized. Every terminal reacted the same they had the same guidelines they they were measured the same so uh, i think that really helped to where south carolina was no different than phoenix mm -hmm. and uh but you know it was difficult i mm -hmm. mean uh you know it, it's not like i'm out managing every every truck driver but, but you had standardization <coughs> and you had how many people working for you at the executive level 35 is that what you said <coughs> well we had uh, we had 25,000 truck drivers and we had five to one ratio. So we had probably 5,000 non-driver personnel. And how many people do you think you had to interact with as the leader? Well, f first of all, I kept pretty involved with the outside terminal. So that was probably 40 and so probably 50, 55 people, 50, 60 people pretty involved. So. And is, was that them calling you or you actually going out and seeing what they were doing? Uh, both. And um, in addition to that, you know, we had probably 25 salespeople that I kept. I probably spent a third or half my time in the sales department. And as I said earlier, I, I felt it was really important to be close to our customers. Yeah. And uh, and that was good news and bad news. I mean, they yeah. they knew who to call when they needed something. And, and it gave us a feel of they, they would tell me, um, all right, we're going to build a distribution center here and start thinking about it. And so, I mean, it, it was a, 
a very strong relationship that I developed with these big customers over the time that mm-hmm. um, other trucking companies hadn't. They'd send their salesmen in, and and uh, but, but I just felt that a tremendous amount of our growth be- was because of the relationship I had with big major customers. Hmm. And, and you know, I mean, that's Walmart, Costco, and Target, and yeah, you know, Sears, Kmart, in their heyday. I mean. Mm-hmm. K- Kmart was our largest customer for years. <laughs> yeah, they had other trucking companies they worked with. You were oh, yeah, one yeah, of the but, larger ones. Yeah, we was the largest. So yeah, and but, so the uh, and so part of your leadership <laughs> style. I, I remember. Uh, did you ever read the book on Lincoln where he talked about Lincoln on leadership? It's a, it's a fascinating book. But one of the things Lincoln said, which kind of sounds like what you're saying, is he said the uh, the key to winning the war was he had to quit listening to the general. He had to get out there and listen to the troops. Yep, yep. And he says it was a completely different story when he listened to the troops than when he was listening to the general. He says, in fact, when he was listening to the general, he thought they were winning. He said when he got out to the troops, he realized, if we don't do something, we're going to lose. You know, almost every Saturday, I would go down and spend a couple hours out at the fuel island just talking to truck drivers, you know, looking at the trucks and how's your truck doing, you know, if we're buying new trucks, what do we need to change? What, how's your trailers? You know, and and I would probably spend a couple hours a week, just out the fuel island talking to truck drivers when they come in, and yeah. and, I, and I think that was important because, you know, the word got around pretty quick, and so yeah. All right. Well, thank okay. you, Jerry. So again, I'm here with uh, Jerry Moyes. Um, Jerry truly is an American icon, as well as being one of the great entrepreneurs of our uh, of our country's time. Appreciate you being here, Jerry. Thank you so much. It was fun to talk with you all about hope. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Jerry.